All right, everybody. So we have Andrew Vygotsky with us today. Uh, I've been hearing about him a lot recently from Greg Knuckles, Cody Hahn, and a few others. They've all been touting him as this genius in the field. Uh, so welcome, Andrew. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. So you mentioned you're getting your PhD in biomedical engineering. Um, now, that's not completely related to exercise science. So can you just give us a little detail on how you, you got into this field and how you had this growing name? Yeah, sure. So I actually originally started in computer science and computer programming, and I left school to be a software engineer. And during that time, I was also bodybuilding. And while I was working at a startup as a software engineer, I realized I did not want to be a code monkey and sit there all day. And I'd rather study and learn about the human body and how we respond to adaptations, specifically resistance training exercise. Uh, so I decided to go back for exercise science and kinesiology. And I ended up going to Arizona State University to finish my undergraduate degree. And while I was at Ar Arizona State, I ended up doing research with Brett Contreras, uh, with whom many are probably familiar. Mm -hmm. And that's when he was finishing up his PhD. Uh, so I helped him out with a lot of his studies, data collection, writing up papers, so on and so forth. Um, after graduating, I then uh, did some post-bachelor research um, I did that at the Hospital for Special Surgery with some biomechanical modeling. And I also was in Brad Schoenfeld's lab where I helped him carry out a training study. And I also carried out my own study um, in addition to that. Uh, so I've studied with both Brett and Brad and I've collaborated a ton with them over the years. Uh, then when I went to graduate school, I started off in heavy, heavy biomechanics stuff. So neuromuscular biomechanics. I did my master's work on the relationship between joint stiffness and muscle stiffness in the tricep surrey and ankle. Okay. And then after I finished that up, I, uh, I ended up moving on to pain neuroscience, and now I'm more into computational neuroscience. Uh, so I've made pretty drastic switches over the past, especially year, uh, but I still follow a lot of the exercise science literature. I uh, still publish in it pretty regularly. I still have a few things in the pipeline for it. Uh, so it, it's certainly an interest and hobby horse of mine, but it's uh, it's not my main focus anymore. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting, man. And um, I mean, you, you don't know that much about me, but I also studied actually science as my undergrad, uh, and then I went to dental school. So it's, it's certainly not my you know primary focus at this point, uh, but it is a huge passion of mine and has been for 15 years. So kind of similar in that regard. Um, and the guy who I did research with was Dr. Nicholas Radimus. So I don't know if you know him, but he is the, uh, the editor-in-chief now in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning. Um, so it, it was cool to work with somebody who, who's that into it. Now, how are you still doing the research if you're not getting, like, let's say your PhD in that? For somebody who doesn't really have any research background, um, I think a lot of people would think, like, unless you're doing your PhD in that work, like, how would you publish in a related area? So a lot of what I do now is kind of analysis driven. Uh, so if, let's say, Brad is carrying out a study in the fall, he'll reach out to me and be like, hey, what is the best way to run the statistics on this? What do you think of these methods? Um, so I can kind of help from afar and provide input and uh, help run analyses and do things like that. Um, also, what was it, a year or two now ago now, we ended up getting data from an Australian group to publish a paper. So a lot of it is secondary uh, with some reviews uh, thrown in, uh, like the EMG review paper, which you may have seen. So obviously, I don't have to collect original data for a review paper. Um, right. So there are ways to kind of publish and be involved in research without actually collecting the data yourself. Sure. And, and I think recently you had a paper out with Greg Knuckles and Cody Hahn, right? Yeah. So that's kind of another example of uh, that was uh, a point counterpoint, so kind of an opinion piece. Mm -hmm. And that was a point counterpoint with Jeremy Lenicky's group where they argue that uh, muscle hypertrophy does not contribute to strength increases at, uh, following resistance training. And we argue that hypertrophy does contribute to strength increases following resistance training. And the basis of our argument um, is kind of manifold. Uh, First, there were some statistical and ontological con uh, considerations. For example, what is hypertrophy? What is strength? There are a lot of uh, kind of ambiguous questions there that kind of need to be defined before you can start to answer the actual question. Uh, there are also statistical considerations on which I've published in the past, uh, namely the between-subject versus within-subject analyses. Uh, 
And then there's also this issue of you have all of these confounders if you're looking for a relationship there. So let's say your moment arm is double the size of my moment arm. It's that's going to really make things complicated. In addition, you have other variables training as or changing as a function of the training period. So if we both have, let's call them neural adaptations, uh, that's going to add variance to the problem. So it's going to be more difficult to find a single variable that correlates with that strength gain. Um, in addition, we argue uh, that due to the potential presence of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy versus myofibrillar, that will kind of cloud things. And when you consider long-term gains for short-term gains, that's that may explain a lot of the variance that these shorter term studies aren't seeing. Gotcha. So, uh, I mean, their argument, I mean, I guess it's just, even when, as you're saying that, it almost sounds strange to me that they would make the argument, because I think as like maybe a lay person looking at this, of course, when you get bigger, you get stronger, right? Of course, gaining muscle contributes to strength. So I guess I would ask, what is their primary argument against? I mean, I'm, I'm sure they would agree that in general, as people gain muscle, they are getting stronger. So what are they arguing against, really? Uh, they're arguing that that relationship could be completely spurious. Um, so the actual change in muscle size is totally independent of the change in strength gain, and that this change in strength gain could be coming from a number of other things, uh, and those things are not themselves hypertrophy. Uh, so for example, this idea of a 1RM being a, being a test, and you're, you just need to practice the test, and it's kind of like it becomes a skill rather than uh, something that you physically adapt for on a, on a muscle fiber size level. Gotcha. Um, they have published reviews uh, reviewing uh, everything from steroids research to uh, mouse research. Uh, they, and they've also published a couple of resistance training studies. Uh, and what they find is, uh, so for one of the studies, they had participants train heavy with one arm and lighter with the other arm. And the heavier arm did fewer reps, so it didn't increase in size as much. The lighter arm did more reps, so it increased in size more. And with that, they tried to kind of dissociate strength from hypertrophy because you might see similar strength gains despite one arm getting a lot larger due to the uh, the higher up stimulus. Right. Um, and, and they kind of argue just because these things, because hypertrophy itself is not the only predictor of strength, it therefore does not drive strength. Uh, so a lot of their work kind of shows that hypertrophy isn't necessary for strength gain, which I would totally agree with. Mm -hmm. A lot of their work shows that hypertrophy is not sufficient for strength gain, so you can get larger without getting stronger, and that's certainly true. Uh, but the basis of our argument is that hypertrophy is a contributory cause. So it's neither necessary nor sufficient. And this is because you have other adaptations such as neural adaptations. Um, so for example, I can get larger, but I may get less skilled at the movement itself. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, so if that, then you have two variables that are changing that are kind of, they're both difficult to measure. And if you can't tease them apart, you're not going to find anything. Right. So that's kind of our, the basis of our argument. And in addition, there's kind of a mechanical basis in that you have these sarcomeres that add in parallel as you gain muscle. And there's a basic tenet in mechanics which states that muscles in parallel add. So if you have more sarcomeres in parallel, those forces should add. So more force should mean greater strength. Um, so I look at this as a very mechanical problem. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, when you actually break it down like that and you actually get into like how many details are involved, I think, and this is something I've said to Greg as well, it's really interesting talking to people like you guys because I think you can only gain so much knowledge on the forums, right, or on Instagram fitness or on even like YouTube fitness for the most part. Right? There's, there's a level where you could hear it like you could be doing 10 years in those avenues and you'll learn a lot, but 
you're never really going to get into that level of detail that you guys are talking about unless, I mean, maybe through, through podcasts with you guys, but really for the most part, I mean, studying this stuff, right? Like really being in like the lab and, and researching it. And, you know, I mean, obviously when you and I were both in our undergrad, we were looking at textbooks of this stuff and there's just a level of detail that isn't going to come across, like I said, on an Instagram post or something like that. So I think it is interesting to, to hear it in that depth. Um, you know, I, I know recently, I think actually just this week, the podcast with Omar that you were on Omar's podcast was posted. And uh, one of the things you guys were talking about was what contributes to strength and, and what factors. So, you know, there we were just talking a little bit about the relationship between or potential relationship between hypertrophy and strength. Can you go into maybe some other factors you mentioned that you can certainly get stronger without getting bigger? So how does one do that? Yeah, so there are several adaptations that occur when you resistance train. Uh, those range from everything from the periphery to the spinal cord and uh, even the brain, if you consider strength or these movements kind of as a skill. Uh, so in the muscle itself, you're going to have adaptations ranging from uh, changes in the myofibrillar uh, protein content of the muscle. Uh, you'll also have uh, changes in the connective tissue and the extracellular matrix. So when these muscle fibers pull, uh, that force has to be transmitted to the tendon somehow. And that's through this extracellular matrix. And these, this extracellular matrix connects all of these muscle fibers to one another and to the aponeurosis. Uh, so if you get a stiffer and more connected extracellular matrix, uh, that in theory could increase the strength of your muscle. Um, and the way that works is, I think Chris Beardsley has written about this in the past, uh, but the idea is that if you have force that's transmitted to laterally to this connective tissue, then that connective tissue can then handle the force. So n the rest of the fiber doesn't necessarily have to transmit that force. Um, then moving up a level, you have the entire muscle, uh, it crosses a joint. So when you change the muscle size, that's going to affect the moment arm of the muscle about that joint. And that's going to happen in a position-dependent manner and a muscle-dependent manner. Uh, we published a modeling study on this as kind of a proof of concept in the biceps brachii and, brachio and brachialis. I think that was published in 2015 in Pure J. And what we showed is essentially as the muscle gets larger, the moment arms of these elbow flexors, at least when you're in full elbow extension, also get larger. Mm. Um, and that's a nonlinear relationship. Uh, with resistance training, you also have a change in the architecture of the muscle. Uh, so if you have an increase in pination angle, you may be able to uh, pack more fibers in parallel for a given muscle volume. Yeah, I was going to say, can you maybe just kind of explain to people what pination angle means? And I mean, I know there's obviously different types of like, you know, pennate muscles, unipennate pennate and all that. So, okay. So a muscle is not necessarily parallel with its tendon. Um, it's the muscle connects to something called an aponeurosis, which connects to the tendon and fibers insert to this aponeurosis and pull on this aponeurosis, but they don't pull straight on it. Uh, they pull on it at an angle. And the force that's transmitted to this aponeurosis is going to be uh, both a function of that force and also that angle. So it's force times the cosine of that angle. And what this means is if you have a really large pination angle, less force is going to be transmitted to the aponeurosis and less the tendon. Mm -hmm. However, with the larger pination angle, there's also this benefit where you can pack more fibers into a muscle for a given volume. Um, so there's kind of this trade-off, too much of a pination angle and you lose force, direct force transmission. But you also, um, but if you do have a pination angle in general, then you can pack uh, more fibers into the muscle. Uh, so you have a greater physiological cross-sectional area. So the muscle is able to produce more force. Right. And also not only can it, you know, change within that muscle, but different muscle groups that people think of have different, like inherently different angles, right? Different pination angles. Yeah, that's true. And now there's, uh, there's been work coming out for the past several years, especially from Tom Roberts lab. Um, and what it is, is this pination angle, while you're doing a dynamic task, there's something called gearing, uh, muscle gearing. So the 
this is essentially the shortening velocity of the fibers relative to the entire muscle. Uh, so penation angles allow this to happen, but what they're showing is it happens in a velocity dependent manner uh, so that you can preserve force output over or kind of maximize efficiency of the muscle over a range of velocities. Um, so it's it's like a beautifully complex biological system that's yeah. very difficult to understand. There are a lot of moving parts. Sure. Um, and we're just starting to learn some of the intricacies, intricacies of them. Uh, so I wouldn't go as far to dismiss something like hypertrophy, especially when we don't fully understand the mechanics of a muscle. Uh, but I do think some of the basic mechanical tenets that we do know strongly suggest that this is a contributor. Right. And, you know, I, I think it is hard on a podcast to get some of this stuff across, right? I mean, it, maybe I should put some, like, pictures up or something to help people out. Um, there was another thing I heard you say where I think for the average person, they're just not going to necessarily understand without some explanation. And we talked about before about um, moment arms and something you said was like a greater moment arm. Uh, will lead to a greater shortening velocity for the same angular velocity. I think 99% of people hearing that are thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> so could you break down at least like what a moment arm is when we talk about that? Because that, that you do hear a little bit more often. Yeah, a uh, moment arm is the uh, perp perpendicular distance from a force's line of action uh, about the center of rotation of a joint. Um, so if you think of a wrench, and you hold the wrench really far out and you want to turn a bolt, it's going to be a lot easier than holding the wrench very close to the bolt. And that's because the moment arm is larger when you grab farther away on the wrench. Right. And muscles kind of work the same way. Uh, but, this, but you also have to consider that muscles are dynamic. It's not just a static, um, it, it's not just static force output. And when you consider that, you have to consider the velocity properties of muscle. So going back to Hill's muscle model, which, which suggests that uh, muscles do have this velocity-dependent force output. So if you contract too fast, you're not going to be able to produce as much force. And relating this back to the moment arm, um, I think it's easier to think about in terms of a circle. If you have a really small circle and you draw a point and then you draw another point on the circle that's let's say 45 degrees away from that and you measure the length along the diameter of the circle that's going to be a pretty small length because the circle is small but if you take a massive circle or let's say the size of the earth and you go 45 degrees that's going to be a massive distance right so for the same angular distance you're going to get a greater change in length Sure. So that just carries over directly to velocity. Um, and when you think if you have a larger moment arm, because that's the essentially the radius of the circle, then that means you're going to have a greater shortening velocity. Um, so the muscle is not going to be able to produce as much force, although you do have the benefit of a greater moment arm. Uh, so there's this nice trade-off, and there's probably going to be an optimal for each muscle for each task. Right. Okay. And um, one other definition, if we could get, would be biomechanics we talked about is, I think, you know, that was one of the first things I heard about you. You know so much about biomechanics. I guess we, that is probably another one that we do hear that term a lot, but, and I, I think most people kind of have some inherent idea of what it is, but when we talk about it, what do we mean? In the simplest sense, biomechanics is the study of biological systems using the methods of mechanics. Uh, so we have this this basic field of mechanics with forces, mechanical energies, um, kinetics, kinematics, so on and so forth. So how can we apply these things to understand what biological systems are doing? Um, and how does essentially the physical world affect these biological systems? And how, does, how do these biological systems interact with the physical world? Uh, so it's just a method of applying mechanics to biology. Gotcha. Um, but you often hear things like, oh, look at that person's biomechanics. Mm -hmm. And with things like that, I think it starts to become kind of vague. Uh, what do people mean exactly? Do they mean um, that person's, I don't know, the kinematics during a movement? I, yeah. I think that's often what people mean 
because unfortunately we can't see forces. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I do think people are like a little fast and loose with language and kind of unclear at times, but yeah, um, I think it's all context dependent though. Yeah, yeah, and, and that probably does relate to, you know, we said before, like one of the questions I had is how, how would biomechanics affect somebody's, you know, injury risk? You know, it, we, it could be for sports or it could be with lifting. Um, but maybe a better question would be regarding to kinematics or even, you know, a lot of people talk about like, oh, this person's good at this certain power lift because of their like structure, their limb length, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's, if I have a, a perfect way to ask that question other than um, how does one's, let's say, body type, movement patterns, you know, all that affect their injury risk, if there's even data on that. Yeah, so I actually haven't seen much I don't know if I've seen any data on that related to lifting. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I, but I guess that's kind of one of the beautiful things about biomechanics. We can kind of use these mechanical principles to uh, kind of go through the math or even use heuristics based on that math uh, to understand what we could expect. Um, so, for example, you probably don't want to deadlift with the bar as far away from your body as possible because mm -hmm. that's just going to increase the amount of torque that you need to produce to get it off the ground. Um, so, um, well, I guess and, one and thing that torque I would ask. Will, yeah, go ahead. One thing I would ask is, is, you know, I think a lot of people, they see certain body types that just seem to be meant for a certain lift, right? Okay. I mean, it seems like a lot of, like, these, like, Asian power lifters, they can just get into this deep squat, and, and they just seem literally, like, built for it. And um, it, it does seem, then you got somebody like Lane Norton, who, you know, obviously a very good power lifter, but just continuously gets injured from his squats, right? Um, and, and he said himself that he, you know, doesn't have the best leverages for it, or however you want to word it. Uh, is there any data on that that you've seen? I think anecdotally, we have a ton of evidence on that, right? And people with shorter arms, they seem to do better with bench press, but not even, it, it also just seems like from what I've seen, uh, lower risk of injury. So have you seen anything on that other than anecdote for, I think the squat would be a good example where you see people who just seem to be built for it versus not. Yeah, I think anecdotally that kind of clicks with a lot of us. Uh, I we did look at femur length in our study, I think, the one that we published, got to publish, published it a couple of years now. And I don't think there was anything too remarkable in our data, mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say nothing exists. Um, so we do know just from a basic kinematics and kinetic standpoint that uh, somebody has to keep the center of mass uh, over the feet. So that's really going to constrain how they can move their body. Then when you also consider an individual's joint range of motion for each of their joints, that's going to further constrain the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so people are kind of locked into this space of how they can move for a given lift. Um, then when you consider the strength of each of their muscles and how much they can contribute given those joint ranges of motion, you start to have all these things kind of pile up and add uh, constraints to the system. Uh, so it's going to be very complex for an individual. Um, and a lot of things go into it, but I guess given all of these things, it's easy to see why things will be so individual. And it may be for those with uh, shorter femurs, for example, uh, that may not that may limit the strength of the constraint uh, due to uh, femur size. Uh, so if you think long femurs are going to it relates back to the moment arm before caused a lot of angular acceleration at the knee joint and the hip joint. And that's also going to result in a lot of flexion at the knee joint and the hip joint. Right. Um, so that's going to interact with the range of motion at each of those joints and also the link tension relationship and uh, force velocity relationships. Uh, so I could see kind of from a basic muscle physiology and biomechanics standpoint why that would be a not a risk factor for injury, but a predictor of how somebody does lift. Um, right. But but it's really difficult to measure these things. And uh, we had a relatively small sample size in our study. Uh, 
So I'm sure if you were able to get enough data and adequately matched uh, skills of the lifters, then maybe some things would pop out. But we had a fairly heterogeneous group as well. Yeah, I think it's tough, uh, especially with lifting, because there, there's so many times you have to like work around something. So I think it would be really interesting to see, OK, people with, you know, this, you know, let's say femur length or, or whatever you're talking about do best with this type of lift or, you know, their, their you know, biomechanics, <laughs> their, uh, their like limb length, every, all their of stature that. And, yeah. yeah. And how does that relate to how they should lift the most weight? But I mean, as anybody who's been lifting for a long time knows, there are a lot of times that you have to work around what's ideal, right? And, and so I could probably bench press more if I had a super wide grip because I have like a six, four arm span, but it just kills my pecs if I do that. So I have to go close grip and it, it's just what I have to do. And if I were to compete, I just have to suck it up, you know? Um, so it, it's interesting, I think, to find or to see if we were to study what is ideal. But I think so many times in this game, you know, we, we have to go with what's not ideal and, and just what we can actually do, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think that's just a limitation of uh, the human body is very high dimensional if you think about it. Um, so let's say humerus length is one dimension. Uh, let's say the shape of your shoulder is another dimension. Let's say the length tension relationship of your pecs is another dimension. The moment of your pecs is another dimension, so on and so forth. And uh, many of these dimensions will interact uh, but they will also, uh, because it's such a high dimensional space, it's going to be more difficult to be similar to somebody else. Uh, right. So the, this idea of there being a normal or an optimal, it's kind of hard for me to fathom uh, just sure. because it's so high dimensional. And I think that's something that uh, a lot of trainers or better trainers appreciate kind of qualitatively. But I do think there's kind of a quantitative idea behind that. And there's actually one researcher at USC, Francisco Valero Cuevas, who talks about the how high dimensional uh, and the nature of the system, and that adds so many constraints that um, movement is actually fairly well predicted because there are so many constraints for an individual. Yeah. What was the, the name there? Francisco Valero Cuevas. Okay. Man, yeah, I, I just left. I used to live like 20 minutes from USC and I, I've stopped in there to do a, a DEXA exam in their, their lab. I wonder if I actually ran across him. <laughs> Should have uh, had him on here. He's brilliant. He's a, uh, he's a mechanical engineer, I think. Is he? Okay, cool. So uh, going forward, I think you mentioned before we have, you have about a year, year and a half left of your PhD, right? Um, in this field, you know, what are you, most interested in kind of contributing to or being a part of in the research? At this point, I just, I think for the most part, I'd like to improve the methods and transparency and uh, maybe some of the statistics here and there. Um, there's been a lot of junk work being done lately, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, people are lying with statistics and um, it's, it's really unfortunate, especially now that I've finished my statistics training and I kind of know better. It's easier to see yeah. and it's kind of depressing. Um, but if when I you say lying with statistics, you mean using statistical methods that maybe shouldn't be used in, in order to have a certain conclusion that really isn't true. So that's, that's one part of it. Um, but there are also explanations that rely on statistical intuition or false statistical intuition. Um, so I'll be more explicit about that. Um, in our letter to the, or not, in our response to Lenicky's paper, uh, we discussed this a bit. And it's the idea that uh, Lenicky's group argues that um, all these people are just correlating random error when they look at the relationship between strength and hypertrophy. So any correlation is just random error. Mm. And this idea originated in one of their papers in sports medicine that came out a year or two ago. Uh, but this relies on an assumption that error between strength and error between, so the error between strength and uh, muscle size is going to be correlated. So that would mean on a day that you're bigger by chance, you're also stronger by chance. Okay. 
So there's going to be random variability day to day in, let's say, your muscle thickness, right? Sure. And there's going to be variability day to day in what you can lift to some extent. Uh, so he's saying that because these correlations that you're seeing are due to random noise, then that means that noise has to be correlated. Okay. So there are, there are a bunch of proofs in basic statistics which show that if you have noise that's totally independent from each other, uh, that that's going to decrease the strength of a correlation. So that, sure. to me, is kind of the basic assumption unless you have reason to believe otherwise or evidence to right. believe otherwise. Um, so he's saying that this random noise is increasing the correlation, but that goes against the proofs that we have. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is Lenicky. I thought he was saying he did not think there was a correlation. Did I get that wrong? I thought, or he actually so they thought the, that they were independent of each other, I guess. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's more of a philosophical causation kind of thing. He thinks they're independent phenomenon. But gotcha. in some cases, they might be correlated. But since they're independent uh, pheno phenomenologically, then that means that correlation is spurious. And he attributes that uh, spuriosity to measurement error and biological noise. Gotcha. Okay. So, Sorry, that's a lot to take in. No, no, but no, I, I think it's good that you're trying to, because I've heard um, Greg, and I, I think Cody talked about that as well. Well, Cody, Cody more so in the sense of like, you know, if you have a problem with the research, like get out there and, and try to fix it. And, and obviously that is something that you're doing. Um, I, I think it's good because, again, 99% of us, I mean, even, even myself, right? I mean, I have much more of a background than most people in it. But I'm, I'm not at this point doing any research, right? I'm definitely not as much in the trenches as you or Greg. Um, and, and so I think it is good that we have people like you who are realizing, okay, like some of this is kind of BS and we need to get the right information out there. And I mean, is it going to make some massive difference in how we're training? You know, is it going to be, well, once we, we get this settled, you know, we'll all be twice as big. Obviously not. But, you know, it, just from an intellectual standpoint, I think it's nice to have the right information out there. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I mean, that's what most of this is about for me. I don't read much of the applied work anymore. I'm much more interested in these uh, theoretical arguments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is totally fine. Uh, but I guess another avenue that I've been uh, really hammering at the past few years is the surface EMG stuff. And I'm not sure if you've read my review on that or I have not to put yeah. you on the spot. No, no, you're fine. Okay, so that's... That's an area that I would like to contribute more to in the future, but the idea of what can we actually infer from surface EMG amplitudes, because there are so many surface EMG studies, and a lot of them uh, kind of assert that one exercise is better than another for hypertrophy, strength gain, rehabilitation, whatever. Um, but the truth is that surface EMG is so complex and so non-stationary, and there's so much going on there that it's very difficult to make these assertions. And I'd really like to see high quality and methodological work and validity work go into that area so that we can say, oh, there's this much of an increase in EMG amplitude after accounting for, I don't know, maybe muscle pination angle and a bunch of other factors. This might map on to an increase in muscle size uh, because we've done this prior validity work and we know that this much of an increase in EMG is associated with this much of an increase in muscle size or something like that. Yeah. But those studies that you would think have been done have not. So um, I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, it's interesting to me that you're interested in looking at that because it sounds like that would maybe disprove a lot of the stuff that Breck and Charis has put out. I mean, I, I know for a while he was kind of known as getting all this EMG data out there. And I think some people have criticized him for maybe putting too much stock in that data and, and you know maybe putting too much stock in the fact of saying you know oh well we have higher emg from this exercise therefore it's a better exercise for this muscle to grow um which i think a lot of people are saying is not true but i would imagine your work would kind of more definitively state that yeah i would want to or at least related in some kind of probabilistic way it's i'm sure it's not straightforward especially since you'll see uh, changes in EMG amplitude as a function of muscle length rather than just as a function of activation. And then with muscle length changes, you're also going to get muscle force changes. So there's a lot going on that I think would need to be accounted for. Yeah. Uh, so, 
So I'm not convinced that surface EMG amplitude alone can uh, can tell us much, but I think that work needs to be done. Yeah, awesome stuff, man. All thank right, you. well, thank you for taking the time tonight to talk and inform all of us. Um, we will have to have you back on. Maybe we'll do a like a round table with you and Greg or you and Cody, um, and especially when you're finishing up your PhD. I'm sure right now you're you're slumped for time. So yeah, yeah, thank you. I'd I'd love to come back. Just let me know and. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Yep. And just real quick, since I didn't mention at the start, I just wanted to mention to everybody here um, that for today's podcast, I will be donating to Operation Smile, and we will have a link down below, as always, if you want to contribute as well. So thank you to anybody who does that. And again, Andrew, thank you for talking. Yeah, thank you.